going. Let's uh, do a quick, quick song and then we'll begin with gratitude and peace talk. It's my favorite song by now. The sun shines bright. Yo, yo, yo. Welcome to Kiss Love TV. Hi, Monica. And everything is in its place. Whoa, whoa. I woke up feeling great. Today was meant for me. And life feels good the way it should, the way it was meant to be. And it's a beautiful day, yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, 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 hey. Jay Moore has joined. Jay Moore. Hey, 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 hey. I like how you say my name, Monica. It is so fun to have you guys. Lots of sunshine hearts. Thank you. Good color you got, Miss Lucille. Miss Lucille is one of those people that regardless of the color that she gets, she is so happy. Some guys don't like getting... I am back, wise ram. You're back. Some people do not like getting some colors. Like the pink is too pinky or the brown looks like poop. And Miss Lucille is one of those people that says, I got the chocolate color. Oh, I got this color. I... So each color she sees is something very positive. So that's something that I cherish and appreciate, Miss Lucille. <laughs> Hi, Jacoby. Great to see. Jacoby is already like... Swimming here like a professional. How do you do that? I love everything. It's a beautiful day. All right, you guys. Positivity is key. I agree, wise round. So we are we are talking about peace and gratitude. So I'm very excited to be talking to you about one of my favorite, favorite, favorite subjects. Another favorite subject is Nutella, but we won't talk about that subject today. One of my favorite subjects is peace. And the reason I love to talk about peace is because I never knew who Arabs were. Hope I won't be um, um, laughing, um, crying today. But um, I didn't know. Say hi to Randy. Oh, um, hi Randy. Hi Randy. Randy. He says hi. He just hi, got hi, out of the hi. shower. Peace and love. Um, all right. So um, I didn't know who Arabs were, and the first time I met Arabs was on the news when Wait. I heard that there was some uh, suicide bombing happening, and I saw that my uh, family was very distressed and calling relatives and making sure you know that that everything was okay. So that was kind of when I first heard the word Arab. Hi from Texas. Say peace and love to Mike and Mayo, uh, Texas. So when I, uh, you know, I, I started to understand that Arabs aren't good because they uh, do suicide bombing. And then I was five-ish. And then there were sirens. And then when there were sirens, we needed to run and hide in a room. I saw my father taking a tape and sealing the windows and kind of closing everything. So in case there was like a chemo, uh, chemical attack, um, we can be saved in the room for a short while. So if a missile would hit the house. That was the goal for 1990, 1991. And I was, um, was five-ish, five turning six. And I was very scared. And then I learned that this too was done by the Arabs. And um, so basically I grew to fear Arabs. And you know what fear leads to? Fear leads to one thing, which is, hate, which is hate. 
right? So I grew to fear and then to hate Arabs. And my course was not a difficult one to predict. The course that I that you know was my course was to be afraid, to grow up, to be suspicious of anyone who looks like Arabs, because my older sister taught me in times of lots of bus explosions and suicide bombings in bus, that when we are on the bus and we see someone who looks scary, who looks like an Arab, uh, we need to get off. So even if we are not yet in our destination or in the class that I was heading to or heading to my grandmother, if we are on the bus and we see someone climbing onto the bus who looks suspicious, we need to get off. And she basically taught me uh, how Arabs look, um, the skin color and the nose and the eyes and the lips and the hair and everything. And, um, you know, even if she wouldn't have taught me, you, you pick that up because you're in a survival mode. Um, and um, we look good. Yeah, Arabs look gorgeous and I look um, very much Arab, I would say, as well, because we, we come from the same same family of the Semitic people. So I would say that uh, that was my course. My course was to be afraid of Arabs, to hate Arabs, to eventually join the army and to be one of those soldiers in a checkpoint at the age of 18, needing to make sure that no suicide bombers are entering Israel, hating every moment of being there, being so negative because I miss my girlfriend, um, you know, dreaming of going out to a club in two weeks when I go home for the weekend, and just hating every moment. And because of hating every moment, and because of hating this amazing stress of me with my friends in the checkpoint needing to basically control and to protect our families back home not far away like half an hour from here like two hours from here like israel is a really small country so i would have to you know have so much stress to you know trying to protect my family and my friends and my girlfriend that my stress would be expressed easily in being short, snappy, nasty to people at the checkpoint. And no matter how much I try to tell myself or, or like the army would do sessions and courses as to the, import the importance of giving service and being humanitarian and respectful and understanding that, you know, the suicide bombers are less than zero, like less, less than 1% of the population that we should be um, greeting and positive towards the Arab people. I would say this is just like words that the army is, you know, has to say and has to, you know, teach us these courses. And basically this is nonsense. And everyone is a terrorist or related to a terrorist. And there was a woman that was supposedly pregnant and she basically had um, under her clothes a, a, a bomb that she transferred to Jerusalem and there was this um, woman who was um, an older woman. So basically I cannot trust anyone. And that would have made me a very negative person that in turn can make and do very negative things. And when a soldier does negative things and is disrespectful, of an older woman and her son, who is 13 years old, sees that at the checkpoint, that son is afraid of that soldier, of what he is going to do to his mother. And that son easily develops from the fear, he develops hatred. So it's only reasonable, only reasonable that Palestinians would hate the Israelis. It's like, it's easy. It's the, you know, the easy way to go about it. And it's only reasonable that Israelis would, would hate the Palestinians. That's, you know, that's what we learn to do. That's awesome, AJ, AJS Carlin. So, basically, I was on this route, on this path that was paved for me by my society. Israelis are just protecting themselves. I would agree. 
Hate is easy. It's true. So, and I appreciate you, Kakaya, for, for contributing here. They don't start fights with the Arabs. Yeah. I will sign off here, but I'm on blab. My battery is about that. No problem, sweetie. Um, thank you. Yeah, and I, I think we all agree with Miss Lucille that hatred is easy. It's the easy route. So, I'm stressing again and again that this was my course, and that this was my path, and that this was my road that was paved to me by my society. Because it takes some, some sort of a miracle for someone's course to change. Think of a person that was um, born into a drug dealing family. And the mother was in drug dealing and in prostitution and the father was in, in drug dealing and pimping. And, you know, you have a course that is set for you when you're born into this kind of circumstances. It's very hard to come out of this cycle of that cycle, of a poverty cycle. Um, and it's also very, very hard to come out of a hatred cycle. Does the Pope's visit didn't work for something? Um, whenever some um, big figure visits, it's actually it helps, especially if they visit um, places that are supportive of peace. So, like even if like a famous singer, I think it was Bono that came here, he said, I want to do a show, I want to do a performance, I want to do a concert, but I want to do it in somewhere that actually supports what I'm about. So he went to this village that is called Oasis of Peace. And that this is a village for Arabs and Jews that live together and that raise their children together, speaking both Hebrew and Arabic and have two teachers in each class speaking Hebrew and Arabic, so basically bilingual and all kinds of good stuff. So he went there to this small village and be, you, you, you know, through a huge con concert. And then through the concert and through the thousands of people that came to the concert, people became more aware of the village and of the cause of the village. And the village had more people that wanted to apply to live in the village. So that's awesome. So when, whenever the Pope comes, whenever you know, a political figure comes, that is awesome as long as they go to places that are actually furthering the cause of peace. Back to my course. So we said that having a course is, um, you know, something that is easy for you to have. Um, which people prevail there? The only one. Uh, high form and core. So I would say that um, my course was predetermined. This is a big point. I, I'm not sure how, how how much I can stress this to you. This is the fact and the fact is that your life in many ways is predetermined it's predetermined all right <laughs> i want to get this this point straight and, and clear here so whenever a palestinian tell me um you know i hate you you are a killer instead of being offended i should see him as you know, wow, his course has been predetermined. I am, uh, I feel for him, you know. And whenever an, an Israeli friend of mine, a Jewish friend of mine, tells me the Arabs are all nasty, I hate them. They sh we should burn them all. We should get rid of them all. Then, you know, my heart goes out to him because his course has been predetermined, and I do not blame him for feeling that way. I was so fortunate to have my course change. And this is possibly one of the greatest miracles in my life. So when I was 13, I was um, going to this art class. Oh, it's cold here. I'm going to turn the AC. I was going to this art class. And the teacher... The teacher in the art class liked me very much. And the teacher in this art class liked me and she told me one day, you know what, Jonathan, I want you to go to this um, weekend seminar in which you will be um, 
doing art with all kinds of youngsters like you uh, for a whole weekend. And it's like in a nice fancy um, community center and you'll sleep there and you will have all of these materials you'll be able to work with and do art. And I was so, whoa, this is awesome. But, and then I told her, you know, what I knew to be the truth. And that was that I cannot go to these kind of events because my parents don't pay for this kind of stuff. So like in the summers, when people would go, would go to summer camps and stuff like that, we didn't have the money. So I would go and help my father in, in his work or stuff like that. Um, you know, I, we, would, we didn't have the money to go to camps and stuff like that. So, you know, I probably will not be able to come to, come to this art camp. And she told me, no, 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 you don't get it, Jonathan. It's actually free. And I was like, free? My mother taught me that nothing is for free. What is free here? And, <laughs> and uh, then uh, she told me it's, it's funded by the United States government, USAID, United States Agency of International Development. And basically they are bringing together young Jews and young Arabs and you will do together an art project during the weekend. And I was like, I am not going to Arabs. No Arabs, no. This is scary. They can kill me. I saw that on TV. They killed this guy in Ramallah. And she told me, no, 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 no. These are kids and you shouldn't worry. Yeah, exactly, Miss Lucille. Good job for the U.S. Um, thank you, Belulu. So she told me, um, you know, it's, first of all, these are kids. They will do nothing. And second of all, this is guarded and funded by the United States. So there will be like an embassy people there and you shouldn't worry. And then I was like, whoa, I'm going to go <laughs> for an art weekend. And this is going to be so awesome. So I came back home. And I told my mother that I'm going to go for this art weekend and it's in two weeks from now and it's going to be so much fun. And, and she told me, Yonichka, sweetie, we don't have money for this kind of stuff. And I told her, mom, it's for free, mama, it's for free. And then she told me, what do you mean for free? I told her, well, you know, it's being paid by the United States government and it's um, in Nablus. And then when I said the word Nablus, which is an Arab-Palestinian city, she was like, ma, no son of mine is going to go to Nablus. <laughs> And um, basically, I understood that I will not be able to convince her to let me go. And even though I told her that, you know, it's you know, funded by the, by the embassy, the United States embassy, and it's protected and stuff. I was 13, Belulu. Um, thank you, Kakaya. Kakaya, you, you listen well, Kakaya. So uh, I was, um, you know, really trying to convince her and I couldn't and I didn't. And then I decided that I'm going to do hunger strike. And I like to eat food. So hunger strike for, uh, for a 13 year old was something that was very dramatic for a, a Jonathan that liked to eat. And I think by the second day that I, you know, didn't eat, I wouldn't eat um, dinner. My father was like, what's up? Why, why is he not eating? And then my mother said to him, he wants to go to this crazy thing about going with Arabs to some camp. Uh, it's dangerous. I'm not going to approve to him and neither are you. And then he said, which camp is it, Jonathan? And I was, yeah, exactly. Hunger, like a fasting thing. Yeah, that's probably the word. Faster, like strike. How do you say it, June? Fasting. If it's for a purpose, it's fasting. Oh, thank you. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the clarification. A, a strike is if you're totally against something and it's, you know, not always a positive thing. But okay. fasting is positive. Yeah, I, I guess it was like a hunger strike or a fasting strike. I was trying to convey to my mother that she needs to... Um, that would know. be a strike. Yeah, that would be a strike. Okay, perfect. Uh, it's like a protest, exactly. So... Um, then my father was, all right, so what is it about? Tell me about what it is about. And I told him, look, dad, it's by the U.S. Embassy and it's going to be protected and they will have guards and helicopters and uh, big machines and cars and you shouldn't worry. And he told me, where is it? And I told him, it's in Naples. 
And then he looked at my mother and he told her, it's not as dangerous as, as you think. It's not as dangerous as you think. And she told him, no way in, in the world that he's going to go. I'm not going to send my son to be killed in Nablus. Um, and, she, and my father told her, you know, hey, Betty, why are you so stressed? What's up? And she told him that Cohen's daughter nearly died two weeks ago in the suicide bombing near the mall. And that um, she is already stressed about her son going to the mall here in Tel Aviv. And here he, her husband, wants her to send her son to the heart of the conflict in Nablus. And my father saw that she was very sensitive and he told her, we should talk about it. And then I guess they talked about it. And I think my father convinced her that it's safe and that it's worthwhile. It's going to be interesting for the son, for the child to be meeting, um, to be meeting uh, Arabs. And, you know, he never goes to this kind of stuff. I think it will be a good experience for him. And, you know, and my mother relented. She said, okay. And um, before I climbed on the bus two weeks later, she hugged me really strong. And she told me, you watch out and you make sure that if anything looks suspicious to you or anyone is threatening you, you go immediately to one of the bodyguards and you tell them that someone is threatening you and you come back home safe and sound. And I told her, sure, mom, I'm going to be here tomorrow night. You don't worry. And I climbed onto the bus and we were, I would say something like uh, 30 Jewish Israeli kids going on the bus to this unknown area called Nablus. And I remember how scared I was. <laughs> I was like telling my mom, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. No worries, mom, mom, leave me alone. It's fine. Like kind of, you know, trying to release her embrace. She was very embarrassing me in front of all the other kids, um, which I didn't know, but that was not a good start to <laughs> have your mom all over you when you're about to spend like two days with some kids at the age of 13. Um, but I do remember that when I was on the bus waving goodbye, I didn't know whether I will come back. It was very scary. We came to Nablus after about an hour ride, an hour and a half ride, and we arrived near a community center and we got off and there were many Arab looking women with all of those things and the long dresses and the veil and um, they were very cheery and excited and she, they welcomed us off the bus and um, I, dis I did see some two guys that I was hoping that they are the bodyguards or whatever. Um, and we all went into this one big room and there were Palestinian Arab kids sitting there. It was like very scary. But the coolest thing was that uh, they didn't have any machine guns and they didn't have uh, any rocks or stones. And they were just sitting there um, being, uh, you know, being kind of friendly, like shy. I could see that the girls are looking at me and giggling and that the boys are like kind of trying to act cool but then some guy came and started to speak in Arabic and then some guy came and started to speak in Hebrew and there was one phrase in Arabic one phrase in Hebrew and basically what they told us is how many of you never really met um, 
Israeli Jews your age? And the kids would raise their hand. And how many of you never really met Arab kids your age? Raise their hands. And how many of you are afraid to be here? And everyone raised their hands. <laughs> and um, how many of you like to paint or do art? And everyone raised their hands because these these were these were you know hand picked from like you know art classes and stuff like that. And after about an hour of introduction and stuff like that, we began to draw. And we were given a huge canvas, uh, the size of a huge wall, and lots and lots of paint. And we've been told that what we need is to improvise, we shouldn't plan, and we should just paint, and we should, um, you know, it's okay if someone comes and help us, we're going to welcome that. We're not going to be territorial about what we are drawing, and everything in the eventually is going to be really beautiful. And we wanted to be really busy with the details. And this is going to do some fundraising, which I didn't know what fundraising was. And it's going to be very good. And this is what we're going to do for the rest of the day, today and tomorrow. Um, and then we began. And I remember drawing things like trees or something like that. So I, I would take my, my paints, my brown and my green, and I would go and you know draw a tree. And then some guy would draw next to me and some, you know, birds and someone would draw flowers and some girl would draw hearts and some, you know, boy would draw a house. And so people would draw um, on this huge wall. And in the beginning, it was very scary. It was very scary because I was like uh, still kind of watching my back, <laughs> you know, like, whoa, what's going on? But what was so interesting um, was that within something like... I would say two to three hours, kind of, you know, in the afternoon, I was not really understanding who is Arab and who is Jewish next to me because we were just drawing. And you're like, it wasn't too much about communicating verbally. It was about like drawing. And someone came to my tree and drew, drew some apples on it. And I kind of liked it. So then I took some, you know, white and I kind of brightened the apples. So it kind of, it was fun. And, I see that, um, I saw that people are, you know, the guys, the kids, the girls, the boys, every, you know, everyone is kind of relaxing. So I, I should relax too. Uh, art unites. It's true. So at that first night, we uh, went to sleep in shared rooms. So we were like two Israeli Jews and two Arabs in the same room. We didn't speak the same language. My English was broken. They didn't speak any uh, Hebrew or, or English, really. I didn't speak Arabic at all. All I knew is Allah Akbar, which is when you hear that, you need to duck because someone is going to bomb themselves. So this was <laughs> the only thing that I knew. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, like the word Allah for me was scary and it's really it's a beautiful word it's the name of god so that was kind of that night i woke up in the morning no one murdered me no one killed me i was excited to eat the food that they prepared for us which was really tasty food i like food i think that food unites too miss lucille not only art um, and then we went back and we painted and you guys by the end of the second day the painting was so beautiful it was so colorful and so big so many colors and it was so exciting to think that we all drew this together and I remember, you know, I didn't really know the names, but I remember, you know, after two days of being around some kids, you you see their face and, you you know, you kind of sad. And when we climbed onto the bus, um, they weren't like hugging or anything, but there were some high fives. And uh, they waved to us when we, when the bus left. And I remember feeling so odd. How, wow, his art is so amazing and pretty. Thank you, Jacoby Collins. <laughs> That's great. Ah, God bless. And um, I came back home and my mother picked me up and she was all stressed. <laughs> and I told her, Mom, Mom, it was awesome. It was great. It was awesome. And I saw how she slowly, like her 
her hands on the wheel were very stressed and how slowly she was relaxing and how she was kissing me and she was so happy that I was back. This is great, this is great. This one, oh, this is so good. This one incident really changed my life. Um, the school year began after that summer. Uh, yeah, I actually wrote that. Uh, Smithia. I wrote it somewhere. The best story. So then, my friends, I uh, was... The school year began. And some... Thank you so much, Carlos. Some... Um, a guy and a girl that was, like like, older came to the class, they passed through the classes in school, and they were saying that there's an Arab-Jewish youth movement that takes place in Jaffa, which isn't far away from Tel Aviv. It's a, you know, it's a bus ride of about 15 minutes. It's like you know, New York and Harlem. So uh, I was told, you know, we were told that there's this youth movement that is for Arabs and Jews. And I remember how most of the kids in the class were like, why would I want to go to a youth movement of Arabs and Jews? This sounds so lame and stupid and scary and dumb. And I was feeling like, you know, this might be interesting. So I took the flyer and um, I called the number and I understood that they are meeting every Tuesday at, at 5. And I took the bus. And I came there, and there were several Jews that were like children of peace activists, um, and several Arabs, and it was fun, and it was interesting, and we checked, and there was good food, and it was for no money, which was important, again, for me and my family. And um, they told me, you know, see you next Tuesday, and I told them, yeah, see you next Tuesday. And then I came back, and then I came back. And then I became a member of this, it's called Friendship, of this Friendship Arab Jewish Youth Movement. You guys probably never heard that there is such a, a youth movement, right? Like all you hear is like that they're you know, throwing stones and killing one another. But uh, there is such a youth movement uh, with branches, with uh, chapters in different cities. That led to me going to another weekend, now through the youth movement, which was way more experien experiential and fun. And I already have my, had my friends from Jaffa, my Arab friends from Jaffa. And we went together um, and we met some Arabs from the Palestinian territories, from some Arab cities, and some more Jews from cities that I, you know, in the north of Israel or in the south of Israel. So it was a big camp and it was so fun and I remember I uh, kind of realized that I can be entertaining even if I don't speak Arabic. Because, um, you know, one thing, I, it's hard for you to comprehend because, you know, not knowing Israel and not knowing Palestine or, or the Middle East, it's kind of hard to comprehend. But basically, that, let me try to clarify to you that the Arabs in Jaffa did speak Hebrew. They understand Hebrew because they grew up in very much in Israel having the same human rights, civil rights, they can vote and stuff like that, and everything is like they're very much Israeli citizens in Jaffa. So they spoke Hebrew. and um, But the Arabs from the Palestinian territories, like Nablus, Ramallah, Bethlehem, Jericho, they did not speak Hebrew. So I realized that I can like do funny gestures and they would laugh and I would laugh. and So that was kind of my way to communicate with some kids in, in that big camp. And one thing led to another. Instead of choosing to focus on French in high school, because you can choose a, a third language. Your first language is Hebrew, second language is English, and the third language you can choose from either Arabic or French. And French was more popular. And I was like, you know, I'm going to learn Arabic because I want to speak to my friends. And I learned literary Arabic. It's called Fusha which is this really Shakespearean level Arabic, which no one speaks. <laughs> it was so funny. And I, I remember going uh, to the next camp and trying to practice my Arabic. 
and I would ask them, you know, where are you from? And instead of saying, where are you from? I would ask them, where art thou from? <laughs> and they would, that would crack them. They would laugh at me so hard. And I would tell them, oh, I cannot like do the equivalent of the English uh, level, but I would tell them, my highest wish is of peace to prevail. <laughs> they would be like, oh my God. Like really, I would tell them in Arabic, Ana Uridu Bissalam. Which now I know that you don't speak Arabic this way, but this was the Arabic that they taught us in school. Um, not really spoken Arabic, not Amiya. Amiya in Arabic is the spoken Arabic, so they taught, taught us this literary one. But, but by now, I was going to this Arab Jewish youth movement. I was going and studying Arabic in school, and my perception of Arabs started to change. And like me, there were few kids in this Jewish, Jewish Arab youth movement, in another um, youth movement, in a um, choir that is taking place, in a um, kind of dance group that is shared, in a group of young filmmakers from Amala and from Jerusalem meeting. So there are many groups such as that. And those groups were changing their people's lives. Yeah, music unites, exactly. To cut the, the, the story short, I would tell you that by the time that I came to be in the army at the age of 18, 19, my goal was to join the army because I, I, you know, I didn't really want to, but at the same time, I understood that if I wanted to influence my society and if I wanted to eventually possibly be involved in politics and if I wanted to do anything in the Middle East and have the credentials and have the respect from my own kind, from my own people, from my older brother, from my nephews, from my uncles, not going to the army, which is not really an option, but you can somehow defect, not going to the army is a big taboo. So I decided I'm going to go to the army, and I, rem I remember um, sharing this with my uh, Palestinian friend, and I told her, her name is Yaffa. I really wish that we could reconnect. For some reason, she uh, cut the ties. Um, but I told Yaffa that I want to join the army and try and change things from within. And she told me that she disagrees with me. And then she spoke to her father, who once sat in an Israeli jail. Her, so her Palestinian father was uh, incarcerated in an Israeli jail. And he told her, listen, you shouldn't blame him. He is right. If he wants to do any change, then if I were him, I would go to the army. And by the way, Yaffa, he told her, not all the Israelis are bad. He's not bad. And there were some uh, prisoners. Prisoners? How do you call them? Like prisoner guards. Like prison guards um, that were nice to me. And they would give me cigarettes. Which was... <laughs> The, their, like his way to receive love from you know, appreciation or some respect from some prison guards. So he told her, you know, if I were him, I would go to the army. And um, she came back to me and she told me, you know, I understand you. You, you go and you, you do what you need to do. So I went into the army and prison guards. Thank you, Kakaya. I went into the army and I... Um, was telling everyone in the basic training course and later on prior to the army during the beginning of the army i want to do something that helps the palestinian i want to do something that helps the palestinians and uh, you know some people raised their eyebrows but some people told me you know there are places such as that in the army and you know you can find one and after a month and a bit, I was situated in a unit that was 
called and is called COGAT. You can look it up on Wikipedia. Coordinator of Government Activities in the Territories. COGAT, Coordinator of Government Activities in the Territories. C-O-G-A-T. And um, this unit was called by the Palestinians the Angels of the Army the good ones of the army because this unit and the, the soldiers in this unit their goal was to make sure that the Palestinians are being given their rights and that they have as much freedom as move, of movement as possible and that even if you know Israel is trying to capture some uh, terrorists uh, or, or suicide bombers, or uh, people involved with ter terrorism, or what my Palestinian friends would call freedom fighters. Um, even if there is a curfew, to make sure that the curfew doesn't lo last too long, and that people can go and get their groceries, and, you know, kind of trying to make it work in an unworkable situation. So very creative people, very creative unit, and the, the head of the unit, which was a major general, which is a very high rank in the army. It's one rank away from being the chief of staff, the head of the army. So this major general, his name was Yusuf, and he was an Arab guy. So in the army, you had an Arab guy being in charge of making sure that the humanitarian needs of the Palestinians are being met. So again, this is something that you don't hear about, right? You know, an Arab guy in the Israeli army, but um, a very inspiring guy. He's an, he, we used to call him the coordinator. So he kind of coordinated, you know, to the Palestinians. He was the uh, one of the faces of the army, um, the kind of the guy that they can write letters to and communicate with and, and try and do stuff with, um, the liaison officer. And to the army, he was like the guy that's fighting for the Palestinian rights and to make sure that everything is right and like for the Ramadan, to make sure that we, you know, can enable the easy flow of Palestinians into the Temple Mount and all kinds of stuff like that. So the all of the army is the IDF, yeah. The whole of the army is the IDF and the IDF, which stands for Israeli Defense Forces, is made out of units. And one of the units is called the Coordinator of the Government Activities in the Territories. Thank you guys for your encouragement. So I joined this unit and for nearly three years, my task was to make sure that things are happening in the right way. And I was fortunate enough to be involved with awesome stuff. A very touching experience was when um, there was this organization called, um, you know, um, Children Fulfill Their Dreams. And this was an organization of that was bringing um, children that were cancer um, patients that had cancer um, and fulfill their dreams. And one big thing that they were doing was to take Palestinian kids and Israeli kids to Disneyland and um, it was a big thing to fly all of them to the States and to, you know, to, to do that for them and I had an active part in making sure that the Palestinians are being granted permission to fly through the Israeli airport of uh, flying through the Israeli airport because it's the most of all places in Israel, it's the most protected area and the most prone to be attacked, right? Airports. So um, they are usually flying from Amman, which is, um, you know, about, um, about an hour ride from Palestine um, into Jordan. So we wanted for the Palestinian kids to be given permission to come to the Israeli airport and fly from the Israeli airport with the Israeli kids so everyone can fly together. And um, we were able to coordinate that, and I was the one typing in all of the Palestinian IDs into the into the computer and making sure that uh, you know if you know all kinds of stuff like that. 
big stuff. I'm very proud of myself for having done that. And um, there was a choir or a music dance that asked for the same thing, for the kids to be living from the same place, um, and for the Israelis to be granted permission to enter Ramallah, which was a big thing. Israelis do not enter into Ramallah. But for, this, for the purpose of the rehearsals, they needed to enter Ramallah, and the Palestinians needed to enter into Tel Aviv. So permissions, 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 and arguing with army officials, explaining to them that this is something big, this is going to be in the news, you are not going to want, it, want it, like to kind of use leveraging uh, guilt and stuff. Like, um, mm. Lieutenant so-and-so, my name is Jonathan, corporate Jonathan, and let me tell you clearly that if you are not going to be the one to approve it, this is going to be on the news and your name is going to be there as the responsible for, <laughs> for not approving these kids to, these Jewish kids to enter Ramallah. And what is going to happen is that the chief of staff is going to reprimand you. So I'm just trying to save your butt and I'm just trying to, you know, just, you know, sign this for me and stuff like this. This is so funny. So I learned lots about uh, like politics and how people think and stuff like that. But literally for three years I was doing stuff like that. And I am very proud of myself for having done what I've done in the army. And I would tell you because I know it to be the truth. Had I not gone to this silly one weekend, never to be repeated again, art camp, I wouldn't have had the interest in serving the Palestinian people and to try and somehow make it work in an unworkable, crazy reality. This whole story, I'm not sure for how long have, uh, have I been talking, is here to answer June's question. June que June's question was, Jonathan, you know, do you think peace is possible and, and, and how? How? The situation is so intense there. And June, love bug, the solution is very simple. Many people are con concentrate on the, the borders and where Palestine would finish, and where it would start, and when Israel would start, and where would it finish, and what, where will be the capital, and will Jerusalem be the shared capital? Oh no! Oh yes! Oh, it's possible! Oh no! Lots and lots of people are dealing with the political stuff, and I appreciate that. I think it's important. But I think that the bottom line is that if you took all... 4 million kids, 4 million kids that are both Palestinians and Israelis, because the region is it's a really small region. So I would say that there are maximum 8 million Israelis and maximum 6 million Palestinians, depends how you count. You can also, also say the opposite, 6 million you know, Jews and um, 8 million Arabs, you know, eventually you don't get into a number that is greater than 14 million. And about four of them, all right, so I, I would say that, um, you know, about a third of them are kids. So if you took the third of them and you mix them up in schools and you let them grow together and play together and do art together, Exactly, to the kids. Exactly. If you would bring the kids together and you make them interact and study together, they are not going to be willing to fight one another. In, yeah, to race relations, exactly. And you know, I'm so proud of the United States for having come th this far. And you know, it's, it's not as good as it can be. And it's going to be much better. And in a hundred years in the United States, I think that race is going to be really a very old issue only in history books. I really do believe that. And I believe that in a hundred years, this is going to be old history here in the Middle East. I know from Northern Ireland what has happened there and how things have healed. I know from post-World War France and Germany, which, you know, it was very intense. I know how things have healed. I know that there are textbooks that are trying to teach the history 
one page the Israeli narrative, one page the Palestinian narrative, and for these history textbooks to be taught in Palestinian schools and in Israeli schools, so people can you know open up their mind to the other side story. I know that there are so many programs, such as the programs that I'm talking to. I know that there are so many villages and schools that are bilingual in Jerusalem, in Nazareth, uh, um, in in the north. There are so many schools that are bilingual and that bring students and study together. Now, I think that it's still you know a drop in the sea. I think June that in time, if we have more schools like that, and if we actually build a thousand schools such as that, or even say like 4,000 schools, such as that, which is a big project. Uh, it takes for, you know, several billion dollars to make that happen, which is still less than, you know, the budget of security and stuff like that. But if you take few billion dollars and you establish 4,000 schools and you spread them throughout Israel and the Palestinian territories, and you take those four million kids and you mix them up together and you have them go to the same school. I think that uh, peace is only a matter of time. And I think that 20 years later, you will have peace. Now, will the parents want to do it? No way. Me, as an Israeli parent, I wouldn't want to send my, my kids to study with Arabs. And me, as an Arab parent, I wouldn't want to have my kids go and study with the Jews. But I think that there are several ways to go around it. Meaning, if the level of education is much higher in those schools, June, then, you know, I might be interested in possibly sending my kids there. If English is taught there from the first grade, and if they're doing an international diploma, such as the IB, the International Baccalaureate, and if it has prestige, exactly, and if there is no violence, and they are very strict, they are not like the lenient Arab schools, or the lenient Jewish schools, in which, you know, there is some violence and stuff, and the teachers cannot control their kids, and the kids are jumping on the tables, and there is no respect for the, you know, for the teachers. If I know that this is like a serious school, I'm willing to send my kids there. I'll give you an example. There are many Muslims that send their kids to Christian schools and to Jewish schools because the quality of education is higher. Even though they will not be taught Islam there. And they see their future and the future of their kids as the most important thing. And they're willing to sacrifice on that and to send their kids to a better school. I believe China, that, Yeah. That's the kind of thing that we need to hear in the United States. Yeah. That comment that you made about Muslims would send their kids to the other schools yes. would never be broadcasted over these airwaves. Wow. Never. Wow. Mm. Am I right, Jenny? I'm not sure because, uh, like in New York, I feel it's very. Um, it's a possibility. You know, yeah, like they kind of all go to school together. Yeah. But I mean, we don't hear about them in the other in the Middle East. We do not hear about no, them not in the Middle East. East. Get together like this and and learn from each other. We hear about everybody fighting yeah. and hating. We don't hear about anything, any efforts being made. None. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I agree. And um, I must tell you that, for example, I have a friend <clears throat> called Riman, R-I-M-A-N. She is an Arab Muslim feminist peace activist. Woohoo! Wow. <laughs> and uh, I love her. And I have emailed her and I told her, I want to interview you on Periscope. And she told me, what's Periscope? So I'm going to try and convince her to come over here. And she will tell you how she, uh, Miss Lucille is writing that uh, American media is so messed up. Let me tell you, Miss Lucille, that international media <laughs> all over is so messed up. So you don't feel so unique. Um, Riman, Riman's parents who are Muslim, sent her to a Christian school. 
so that she can learn English, so she, she can have her, a higher level of education. It's unfortunate for my Muslim friends telling me, you know, our schools aren't as good as your schools. It's, it's, a, really, it's a big pity. So, uh, but it's not the, the truth for all the places. Um, some Muslim schools are better than the Jewish schools, but you know how it is. It depends on the specific school. So, I would say that if there was some, such a prestige in those peace schools, and if English were to be taught as a main language, not as a second language, but possibly as the first language, and if there was uh, to be international baccalaureate, and that's great to hear, Belulu, and if there was, um, let me take it one step further, if there was respect for the tradition and for the religion, so religion won't be banned, right? Because like, if I'm an Orthodox Jew, I will never send my kids to this bilingual school because I would think that they will divert, they, they will go away from the religion. But if I know that this, this specific rabbi, who is one of the best rabbis, endorses this school and teaches in this school, so that means that the school embraces religion and embraces the different faiths, I might be more inclined to send my kids to this school. And finally, and this might be radical for you guys in the United States, but uh, let me tell you that you know it is the truth for, for some religious people here, Muslims religious people, Christian religious people, and Jewish religious people. Um, if I knew that some of these peace schools are actually... Um, only for boys or only for girls, I might be more inclined to send my child being religious. Now, I am secular. I am more than happy to send my kids to, my future kids to schools that have um, girls and boys, regardless of Arabs, Jews, whatever. But girls, I think it's good and healthy. But some religious Muslims do not want their sons to be studying with girls. And I respect that. Rather than me trying to fix them, or to correct them, um, co-ed, yeah. Rather than trying to fix them, I want to embrace their belief and their tradition. So I think that there's nothing bad in a boys' school that is for Jews, Muslims, and Christians. And I think that through their interaction, they can strengthen their own roots. And some of the best periods in Judaism was, for example, in Spain around 1200, so around 800 years ago, when there were open debates and open interaction between rabbis and sheikhs and priests. These were times that were good. So I think that um, it's actually going to strengthen religion and faith and stuff like that. And just as a bracket, as a side note, let me tell you that I think that though most of you think that religion is the cause of the conflict, I will tell you that religion can very well be the solution for the conflict. And there is an organization called Rabbis for Human Rights. There is an organization called the Interfaith Council of Israel. There, is an, there are so many organizations that are using and leveraging the power of faith and the power of religion. All of you that are Christian, know the power of Jesus Christ in healing and in bringing um, love to people and in bonding people. And I, th I think that it's the same with all religions. It can be the cause and the solution. It's true. It's true. And I think that as, as we mature, so do, yay, yay, yay. So does our religions mature. I think Christianity today is more mature than it has been. Seeing a Pope saying to the Jewish people, I'm sorry for the Holocaust. This is a biggie. This is a biggie. And I don't think that that could have happened 50 years ago. So I think that Christianity is maturing. And I think that Judaism is maturing. And I think that Islam is maturing. Islam is such a beautiful religion. I really invite you, most of you, you know, being Christians or coming from a Christian background or from a Jewish background um, to learn about Islam. Islam is a beautiful, beautiful religion. And, you know, if you want to say that it's a violent religion, then look into Christianity.
and look into Judaism and you'll see some violent religions. So nothing is black and white. Things are very well rounded and the bottom line of this short, long now speech is that peace is possible. There are many people that are working for peace on a daily basis. I'm going to try and bring them onto here. I have this rabbi friend called Eliyahu McLean. Google him up. You'll see amazing stuff by him. What's the spelling? Eliyahu. E-L-I-Y-A-H-U. I misspelled it, but Google, Rabbi Google will help you. And then McLean is MC, you, you probably know it better than me, like Shirley McLean, like something McLean, M-C-C-L-A-I-N, something like that, exactly. And he is awesome, he is awesome. And he's a rabbi who went to Egypt to study Arabic, and he speaks Arabic to Arab leaders, and they respect him a lot. And he says, Judaism isn't about violence. Judaism is about acceptance and loving. And uh, he is a great example for me. So, yeah, guys, uh, this was so great. And I have enjoyed it so much. Thank you for writing it down, Jenny. Um, on a global scale, belief in God and Jesus is what categorizes Christianity. It's true. Yeah, it's true. I see that there is some uh, Catholicism. Protestant um, talk here, but um, definitely I think that there is possibility for peace and to sum it up in one sentence, I do not think that it is a question of whether peace will prevail. I know that it is only a question of when. And me and my friends Arabs and Jews, Muslims and Christians, we are working for that. And I am very proud to be part of a movement that is growing rapidly each year and that is changing the face of the Middle East. Peace will prevail. Thank you guys for listening. I had so much fun. Now I want to eat my fruit salad. Yum, yum, yum. <laughs> That was the good gratitude game. <laughs> yeah. This was the gratitude game for today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, June. Thank you, all of you guys. I cannot believe having 20... You know, having all these live viewers. Veronica, Rachel, Mariah, Maria, Ian, Yael, Belulu, Jenny, Jacoby Collins. Jacoby Collins, you rock. See, we picked you up today. Miss Lucille, Divya, Shari, he hitchhiked. He was like, can you take me to a fun place? We were like, sure, hop in. Uh, I love you guys. Thank you so much for being here. I'm sending you a huge, huge hug. And if you have questions, no, you rock, Rachel. If you have questions, then feel free to write to me or to write them down and to ask me in the next scope. And until then, I shall see you. Thank you for the encouragement. Thank you for the hearts. Our generations are changing regarding religion. No longer we are so set in tradition, but more open. It's true, more open-minded. I agree. Thanks. No, thank you, Scooter Gal. I like your name, Scooter Gal. I appreciate you. Thank you, June. Thank you, Jenny, for being live with me and, ex and supporting me. I've, I've been feeling your love. And thank, thank you. you for having us. It Me. Was, it was it was fun having you. Really fun. It's Shari. Hi Shari. Alright guys. I am sending you a huge huge hug. Big 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 hug. Beautiful story. Thank you so much for watching and for being here. I feel you. I feel your love. And until we shall meet again in a few minutes or in a few hours, I'm signing off. Bye bye. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being here.